Trouble in Turkey will put wasabi powder on your hazelnuts. Trouble in Turkey is going to put wasabi powder on hazelnuts. Yes, Trouble in Turkey will put wasabi powder on your hazelnuts. Let's break the devil's leg. Welcome to The Knock-On Effect, the show that starts with the thing you know and ends up in a strange place. I'm Alex Rosenberg, joined today by the co-host with just the right amount of spice, Justine Underhill. Thank you. And by the man who knows all the nuts and bolts of the financial world, the professor himself, Roger Hurst. As always, wonderful to be here. And you're back on the farm, which is, which is very appropriate, as you guys will say. Um, first, Justine, Roger and I are going to try to take you from a Turkish crisis to spicy Hazelnuts. Your job is to guess where we're going before we get there. So with that in mind... Sure. Do you like the hazard to guess here? Okay, so we know that the Turkish lira has been falling. Sure. So Turkish products are now going to be cheaper. Okay. I'm going to guess that hazelnuts, I mean, this seems Turkish, okay. maybe. Maybe these get cheaper. And so because these are cheaper, uh, China and Japan love hazelnuts. And they now are going to import more hazelnuts. Although, I do have to make a point, um, China's been hit pretty hard too, so I don't know where the wasabi powder comes in. So we're going to get into all the China, all the hazelnut stuff. I'm going to keep a, a poker face for now and just, and just launch into it okay. with the thing we know. So Turkey, we know it's been a very volatile political situation for, for years now, and President Erdogan has been making a series of increasingly authoritarian maneuvers, but, but this has recently come to a, a head in a financial crisis, which, R Roger, just uh, you know, remind us and, and, and tell us the history of what's going on in Turkey right now. There's a couple of things, uh, and the obvious ones are the sort of the ones we know about, which is there's been the political backdrop, there's been some issues in terms of the current account, but what's really happened in the last few days, the catalyst has been that Trump's turned his sights on Turkey, and there's been this, there's an American pastor called Andrew, Andrew Brunson who's been held in Turkey for two years, or nearly two years, over a some outlawed political groups. And Trump wants his, him freed. And, and on the back of that, he sort of said, well, you know, tariffs, trade wars. And this has been a catalyst for a, a very precarious position. And people have started withdrawing capital out of Turkey. The Lira's moved. The current account's been a problem. So this has all sort of blown up into a political story. But there was an economic story that's been there for well over 12 months. Yeah, and let, let's focus on the Lira specifically, because that's where you can see um, the international investment community kind of changing their mind in a hurry about this country. Yeah, that's right. You can see it uh, very, very clear in the currency. So the dollar Turkish lira was at 3.8, so 3.8 lira to the dollar at the beginning of the year. It's currently around about 6, and it was briefly hit 7.2 on Monday the 13th of August. And these are levels which one bank said, you know, at 7.1, the Turkish banks would go bust. So it's been at very, very low levels. It's slightly recovered, but yes, the Turkish lira has gone from 3.8 to a low uh, versus the dollar of 7.2. Yeah, and so this has had some really devastating effects on the country. It's, it's actually impacted the, the poor pretty significantly, because think about it, if, you, if you're making you know, 10 lira now, you can, that buys half or, or less of what it, what it used to if you're buying international goods. Yeah, I would imagine, though, it would be good for exports, though, from Turkey. Yeah, exactly. And, and Roger, you have some, some color on, on what this could mean for the exporters there. Yeah, spot on. It is very good for the exporters. And it's good for the exporters, particularly those who source all their materials internally and then export, because global export markets generally work in dollars. And so if the Turkish lira has halved, it means that foreigners can buy twice as many goods. So for all the big exporters, things like vehicles, machinery, there are some foodstuffs in there as well. There is this great opportunity for these exporters to, to see increased international demand for their goods. Yeah. And one of the goods that Turkey makes is... Yes. Hazelnuts. Turkey produces something like 70 to 80% of all the world's hazelnuts. Can we eat these now? Yeah, you can eat these. These, um, I got these, these uh, down, down oh. the road. They're a little, little stale, I have to say. A little chewy. A little chewy. Um, but uh, but oh. yeah, Turkish hazelnut producers could definitely benefit from more competitive pricing. It, you know, to put it in really simple terms, it, as they, they don't have to charge it. International hazelnut markets happen in U.S. dollars, 
so they can afford to, to charge fewer dollars. Now, their costs might go up because of fertilizer and stuff might become more expensive, but on the whole, it, it, it's pretty good. It's beneficial. Um, and they produce how, what percent of the world? Yes, yeah, 70% of the world's hazelnuts amazing. come from, from uh, Turkey. And, it, and the, the, the price changes are, are already happening. So there's a recent article from the trade publication IEG VU um, that Okay. I, I went into the weeds for this one. Uh, th th reported that hazelnut price has been stable in Turkey's own domestic market, but that in the inter international market the prices are falling. And since Turkey is is controls the whole market, the entire market, according to this reporter, uh, the ha entire hazelnut market is in a state of flux. So now th let's move on to the knock-on effects here, which is, you know, who might these Turkish producers be taking share from? Oh, right what now? other country? Yeah. Oh, um, somewhere in the Middle East. Oh, J China, Japan. No. Um, <laughs> Italy is the second largest producer oh, okay. of hazelnuts. So Piedmont, uh, home of Barolo wine uh, oh. and truffles also, also does make hazelnuts. The third largest producer, we're, we're sitting in it. It's the United States. Oh, really? And I'll give you a chance to redeem yourself. What state makes 99% of our hazelnuts? Wisconsin. No. No. Uh, or Oregon. Okay, I had a I had a one in fifty shot. Yeah. One in fifty one. I would have gone with. This. I mean, if you said Alaska, uh, yeah. <laughs> so hazelnuts, by the way, are the state nut of Oregon. Alaska has no state fruits or state nuts. Isn't that weird? Um, no. Yeah. So Oregon makes about three percent of the world's hazelnuts. Really, the only place in the U.S. that they make any. And hazelnut producers in Oregon are are starting to get worried. Uh, the tumbling value of the Turkish lira could have the same effect as quote sixty five to seventy percent of the world's hazelnuts going on super sale. Wow, so they're in trouble. And, and this isn't actually their only problem. They also have trouble from, and we're going to talk about trade with China again, as we of seem course, to do every week, right? Relates to that. But part of the trade war that, that I, I didn't even plan this, but part of the trade war between the U.S. and China has focused on hazelnuts. China's retaliated by uh, they used to have tariffs of 25% on in-shell hazelnuts and 10% on shelled hazelnuts like these, huh. which are also known as kernels, just a little hazelnut uh, lingo. Mm. So they've hiked those from 25 and 10% to 65 and 50%. Wow. So, so Oregon hazelnut well, producers been, were already They've in been it. hurting, and now this uh, actually increases. It adds, adds, a double, it adds a double weight. I wonder if we might see government subsidies to the hazelnut industry. And there's been talk of that. Ah. But the other third problem for hazelnut producers, which is a long-term problem, is production. So hazelnuts are, are really taking off. In, in 2017, or it was, a, to be fair, a bad year for hazelnuts, as I'm sure you know, Oregon harvested 31,000 tons of hazelnuts. They're expected to harvest 56,000 tons this year. By 2025, we could be looking at 90,000 tons of hazelnuts coming from oh. Oregon, partially due to, to a big increase in acreage. Yeah, so existing producers do have bigger problems than Turkey. But on the margins, I mean, this is something that they are worrying about in the short term. Well, they're being hit on several fronts. I mean, sure. so there's more production of hazelnuts in Oregon. Uh, they have the Turkish lira, and then they have the Chinese tariffs. So it's, it's all sorts of different directions that they're being hit in terms of, well, I guess the next question is, what's the demand like for hazelnuts? So I'm a big consumer of hazelnuts. Are you? I am. I eat a jar of Nutella quite frequently. Yes, and Nutella, I, I, I might add, it, uh, uh, is like something like a quarter of the world's hazelnut supply oh. goes into Nutella. Oh. Um, be, so be, good. Because, because hazelnuts are, are not used for much, and this is, this is where I'm gonna divert us a bit, and we're gonna get dangerously close to the previous episode of the knock-on effect, but I have here, so I went to CVS, I, and I bought some, some nut products. Ooh. So these are wasabi almonds. Oh. These are dark chocolate almonds. These are whole natural almonds. These are smokehouse almonds. These are habanero barbecue almonds. Oh my god! They sold 11 kinds of almonds from one producer, Blue Diamond. And this is actually, a, and they also you know, make a lot of almond milk too, which is the tie in to, to, the, to the last episode. But Blue Diamond is a really fascinating company. They, they're actually a, a cooperative. They were founded by a group of almond, California almond growers in 1910. And, and still owned by almond growers, what they, all they do is they take almonds, process them, and then they sell them in the U.S. around the world. Huh. And they've been doing this a few ways. One is by finding ways to integrate them into all sorts of snacks and products. The other is by, you know, they've advocated for free trade, 
and they've been very successful in t tailoring the product. So Japanese are now huge snackers on almonds, which was demand that was entirely created by this one cooperative, Blue, Blue Diamond Growers. Yeah, there's been a surge in, I mean, everybody's eating almonds now. But here's what's fascinating. I went to CVS, they had 11 kinds of almonds from Blue Diamond, 11 flavors and different sizes in some of the flavors. Oh, and I, I forgot the fanciest kind of almond they sell, the crafted gourmet almonds, pink Himalayan sea salt, oh. also made by Blue Diamond, although the logo's a bit smaller. Wow, so they are really pushing uh, the it, almonds. It, they have about 25 kinds of almonds. I asked for hazelnuts. This literally is the only thing I could find that had hazelnuts. It's just a mixed nuts, a really kind of shoddy looking mixed nuts that has some hazelnuts in it. Yeah, people don't usually eat these. But there's no reason why. So, so the, the person who worked at CVS was actually shocked to realize they didn't have any hazelnuts. I asked the, the checker lady too, I said, you know, what do you prefer, almonds or hazelnuts? She said, ah, uh, that's a tough one. Because, yeah, I, I agree. I think I'd just as easily eat a hazelnut as an almond, don't you think? Okay, so it's, now's a good time to invest in the hazelnut industry. And so that's what people are doing. So oh. a, lot, a lot of this new acreage is coming from people who are anticipating new demand for hazelnuts because nut demand is doing very well across the board. And, and yeah, people want healthier, healthier snacks, yeah. whatever that is. And well, I mean, come on. It's they, healthier than a chocolate bar. I'll yeah, of course. That. So, of course, that's the, the biggest use of, of, um, is chocolate, <laughs> of, of hazelnuts is chocolate. But, but so the hazelnut producers are... are kind of wising up to this. They're, they're maybe a bit behind the times, but the Hazelnut Growers of Oregon recently has built a 120,000 square foot processing plant to make what they call market value added consumer products. And here's just some great quotes from someone who works with the organization. Value added is, instead of selling an ingredient or whole nut, it's taking that kernel and cleaning and roasting and packaging it and selling it as a consumer product. If we stay in the commodity nut business, either in shell or selling as a commodity to big companies, we're just playing the price game. If you look at Blue Diamond and all the different products almonds are in today, that's the direction we're headed. We're not looking at products that have never been produced before. We're saying, what are the top items nuts are in and let's produce those types of items. That's what the consumer wants. So let's find a home for these hazelnuts now because okay. I went over to uh, Kahlua Stands, which if you haven't been is like the best store. And I, I hear four options for ways that the Oregon hazelnut growers, oh, don't, don't look, at, don't the, look uh, yet. at the flavors yet. Four ways that they might want to package their hazelnuts. So let's, let's give them each a try oh, here. Oh no, you know I'm a super taster. I know, but I-, I Is there anything spicy in here? Uh, this one's a bit spicy. Okay, I'm not eating that so, one. Here's the thing of that. Okay, that's pretty good. Yeah, this is um, this is popcorn salt. Oh, that's good. It's nice, I like isn't it. it. Ooh. Um, these are ground bay leaf. Did you just buy these bags and put hazelnuts in them? Mm -hmm. Oh. That's a little bit spicy. That's nice though. That's nice. This is the classic. Hazelnut uh, concoction, if you will. Mmm. Yeah, yeah. So this is a uh, red cocoa powder here. Um, and finally, oh, don't get it all over you. I know. Is it too late? And finally, we have uh, Spanish smoked paprika. Oh, I can think I can eat that. Yeah, I don't think so. Ooh, this is really good. I know the chocolate is very good. That's a good combination. The bay leaf is interesting too. I think I like the popcorn though. Yeah. So. Let me just try this one. Paprika's fine. Yeah, it's a little bit of smokiness. Doesn't really do anything for them. I think I'm going to do better with smokiness so than hazelnuts. So this is your way of competing with Blue Diamond? I think that if they sold these and, uh, you know, maybe these in a luxury, or oh, I guess the popcorn ones. Well, I think you have a business in front of you. And this is actually a big business opportunity. I mean, it, this relates obviously to what we talked about before with vanilla beans and Sort of my complaint about, well, why don't they just, you know, make the vanilla ice cream there in Madagascar? So hazelnut producers actually are trying to do this. Um, they're trying to add more value so that they don't have to compete with Turkey. And again, there's something that's happening anyway, but, but I really do think that on the margins, what's happening, if Turkey continues to collapse, we're more likely to see wasabi hazelnuts in addition to Interesting. wasabi almonds. Professor, do you, do you uh, agree with me? Yeah, I do. I, I mean, maybe not the wasabi variety. There's so many more pleasant versions that you can come out with, but um, it's kind of got to happen. It's the economics of it. And uh, if you get flooding the market from Turkey because of that cheapness, then yeah, these guys, and it just makes sense regardless of Turkey. It makes absolute sense for these guys to add value to these products and, and compete with almonds. 
So I don't know if people heard the podcast episode with uh, Ralph Powell. The last episode, um, we, did, we did a short summer podcast series, and he was talking about how Turkey could lead to this global negative financial situation as you know, a country start snapping up dollars um, and emerging market currencies across the board fall, uh, which, which could you know, lead to all sorts of negative knock-on effects there. So this is sort of, sort of an opposite way to take it, but in, in this you know, interconnected global world where yep. the dollar undergirds all these markets. There's is so much going on because it's, yeah, it's not just the dollar, it's you know, trade tensions that are going on, it's um, everything that's happening with the lira, and that has so many different knock-on effects into, you know, you wouldn't think it would necessarily lead to Oregon, but there it is. But, you know, and it probably, it affects um, the other countries. I'm sure Italy's um, looking into ways uh, for hazelnut production and, and changing that. I'm sure also a lot of other Turkey's exports are also affecting a lot of other markets. So there's so many knock-on effects from what someone could call, you know, a country that they don't think about very much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that does it for the show this week. Um, we have a new episode every Thursday on Real Vision, and we release the podcast episode on the podcast feed, Real Vision Presents. We're going to talk more about why, you know what, the bay leaf doesn't really work, but popcorn hazelnuts could catch on. Yeah. And for more on markets and the economy, make sure to check out realvision.com slash knock on effect where you can sign up for your 14 day free trial. Yeah, a lot of good stuff on the site, a lot of new stuff coming down the pike as well. We're, we're actually here in our new studio in, uh, in Midtown Manhattan. Hooray, uh, we made it. That's why, we, why the vodka is here from the last episode. And their lottery tickets. The uh, coconut, ooh, the coconut bugs with the, yeah. the hazelnuts might be actually ooh, a really no, good combination. They no should try this in Oregon. All right. See you guys next week. Oh.